They called it the New World. But to the first settlers, America was mostly wilderness and water. From the forests came their timber, and from the tumbling streams, power to help build a civilization. With crude wooden dams, the pioneers harnessed the power nature offered. On a thousand wild rivers, they built their little mills. Wooden wheels turned. In some places, they are turning still. Charles Howell, Master Miller. In the nuclear age, he operates a rumbling assembly of water-powered paddles and creaking wooden gears. It is a grist mill. The mill is at North Tarrytown, New York. A reconstruction of one built here by Frederick Phillips, a Dutch-born settler. His original 17th century house stands nearby on the last few acres of Phillipsburg Manor. Once by royal decree, his land holding stretching 200 square miles, now a National Historic Landmark, restored through the generosity of John D. Rockefeller, Jr. If old Frederick Phillips were to mingle with today's visitors, he would find familiar scenes at the country headquarters he used to call the Upper Mills. In Frederick's time, farmers flailed their wheat by hand to separate the grain from the stems. A good man with a flail could thresh about seven bushels a day. With a modern harvesting machine, today's farmer can reap, thresh, and clean about 200 bushels an hour. On the colonial threshing floor, after flailing, there remained a small yield of wheat which was carefully swept into winnowing baskets to prepare it for the mill. Then the farmer opened his barn to the wind. As he winnows the grain, the useless chaff blows away on the breeze. The cleaned wheat remains to be bagged for the mill, as it was in the Hudson Valley almost three centuries ago. Miller Charles Howell and his apprentices would have felt at home in that bygone age. They work in a strange amalgam of time. Operating today's mill as it would have been run at Phillipsburg Manor when the 18th century was dawning. To the upper mills, hub of the manor's agricultural operations in that era, came the grain, supplies, and trade goods. Upon delivery, the miller became responsible for the farmer's laboriously harvested crop of wheat. Then, as now, the first task was to hoist it to the granary for drying and storage. The water power that will grind the wheat also hoists it to the granary. floor below, machinery grinds the grain continuously. 
wheat falls through a chute from the granary bins into a hopper over the millstones. From the hopper, wheat falls upon the shoe, which scatters it to prevent clogging the stones. A revolving striker vibrates the shoe with such a clatter and chatter that some ancient anti-feminist miller named it the damsel. Wheat drops into a hole in the turning upper stone beneath the wooden cover where it is ground, the flour coming out the delivery chute. Miller Howell checks the texture of his flour with a practiced hand, adjusting the tenter, or space between the stones, a paper's thickness for a good fine grind. Another machine sifts and grades the flour that comes from the stones in the final production step called bolting. Freshly milled wheat containing both the ground flour and the bran passes over vibrating sieves, separating coarse and finer flour. The bran is left to become cattle fodder. Most colonial households baked with coarse flour. The finest was barreled for export. But wheat flour was only one product of the mill at Phillipsburg Manor. At the turn of the 18th century, corn also grew across the manor lands and every farm family shared the tedious chore of first shucking the dried ears by hand and then shelling the kernels for milling. Deep into winter, this work went on. No faster than there were hands to do it. But satisfaction lightened the monotonous task. Every bag of corn the colonial farmer sent to the mill was a hard-won triumph of his labor and perseverance over the weather, the pests, and the land. The weighing at the mill determined what the farmer would receive for his corn crop and what the colonial miller would keep for grinding it. For both, the weighing was critical. The mill's grinding fee was often one-sixth of the farmer's corn, one-eighth of his wheat. The mill gave cash or credit for the tenant farmer's crop, which would become part of Phillipsburg Manor's trade with other colonies, the Caribbean or Europe. On each bag, the miller marked its weight in stone and pounds for accounting. One stone equaled 14 pounds. In the business and community life of a colonial town, the hard-working miller was a substantial figure. He was a pioneer industrialist two generations before the American Revolution, directing what was the only mechanized production operation of the times. Farmers and townsfolk, the 18th century mill was a pleasant place to stop and rest and hear the latest news that cheerful Miller had gleaned from other visitors. The mill's workings amazed farmers who marveled how the machinery could produce in a single day an incredible two tons of flour. For his own little crop, a farmer labored much of the year. Some visitors discovered more personal matters of interest, and few could pass the mill without pausing to watch or to muse for a moment, soothed by the spell of the splashing wheel.
Nearby, with solid oak and practiced skill, the mill's cooper fashioned staves for barrels and casks, which would hold the flour and other perishables Phillipsburg Manor exported by ship. Amid his shavings, the cooper assembled the barrels from staves he had tapered, beveled, and shaped by eye alone. When bent, they would fit perfectly into the double curve of a cask. The cooper's craft was regulated closely by law, which prescribed a barrel's capacity and even the number of hoops. A flour barrel had to hold 196 pounds or 14 stone. Barrels and casks were the universal shipping containers of the 18th century. They withstood drops and bumps, and one man could roll or tilt them. Flour mills measured their production capacity in terms of barrels per day. A good cooper turned out two completed barrels daily, each built to last for 30 years. Biscuits filled many a Phillipsburg barrel. They were baked at the upper mills in ovens preheated for hours with red-hot coals. Made with Phillipsburg flour, the biscuits provisioned Phillipsburg's own ships, one of the manor's efficient operations. Biscuits, the produce of Phillipsburg Manor, came together at the mill pier. Now the work of the manor folk was complete. They had produced a cargo of value, food for their fellow colonists, and for shipment to distant corners of the 18th century world. The grip of 20th century winter stills the powerful wheel. The mill slumbers in its memories. But there are no idle moments for the modern miller and his apprentices. This is the time for repair and preparation, for careful maintenance of the massive stones and all the working parts of the mill. Cautiously, the miller's men lift off the runner stone. Weight, 2,400 pounds. When it's fully raised, the apprentices can turn the stone upside down and lower it to the floor to dress or sharpen the grinding surface. Below, Miller Howell checks the main shaft which connects the water wheel with the gears. In the face gear which drives the pinion, he replaces one of the tightly fitting beechwood teeth. attached to an iron axle or spindle which supports and turns the runner stone. Moving the tentering staff on the milling floor raises and lowers the whole assembly to adjust the stones while grinding. The miller inspects the spindle which projects through the stationary bedstone to tenter the runner stone when mounted on it. To sharpen the hard French quartz by chipping takes 15 hours per stone every three weeks. When grinding, the furrows of opposing stones cross like a scissors, made of separate pieces cemented together. 
a good millstone will serve 100 years or more. Uneven spots are detected with a staff. Another ancient device, the jack stick, tests the spindle's alignment. If the quill scrapes the level bed stone anywhere, the spindle is not plumb and won't balance the upper stone. It's good. The winter's work goes on. The mill dozes to the click of the tools, the murmur of the frozen river, and the whisper of the wind. By the time the thaws of early spring send the river thundering over the dam again, the work at the mill is complete. The apprentices reassemble the freshly sharpened stones for testing. With tentering staff, Charles Howell moves the runner, balancing more than a ton of dead weight on the spindle. Wedging the stone, the miller calls for a running test. Next, they replace the round case that traps the flour or cornmeal as it sprays from the stones. If the grind is fine and true, the winter's work has been done well. If the corn grinds poorly, the equipment must be dismantled and everything done again. Once the mill would be grinding another harvest. But today's miller works with the grist of history, bridging the centuries for those who would return for a while to an earlier time when wooden wheels turned and America was young. <laughs> 